and welcome everyone to the 16th webinar uh, organized by manav human atlas initiative uh, today we have with us uh, dr uh, hello i am audible right yes yeah so today we have with us dr anu ragunathan she is currently a principal scientist in the chemical engineering division at csir ncl in pune she has been with ncl for the last 10 years she has also served as a faculty in infectious diseases at mount sinai school of medicine in new york her research group the metabolic inquiry and cellular engineering group uses system approaches to understand biological cell behavior and function she works on applying these principles to understand drug resistance in cells and also manipulate cells to make desired products she is also an associate editor for biosystems and elsevier publication and an active board member of the international study group for systems biology uh, dr anu will be speaking to us about metabolic systems biology approaches to overcome drug resistance in cells uh to give you a brief background um and what is coming next intrinsic to systems biology is a notion that biological systems have emergent properties many such properties cannot be explained through the genotype phenotype relation fundamental to all biological systems any organism can be represented qualitatively as a biochemical reaction network reconstruction which help us to understand and simulate the physiological function of cells complex networks and interactions now at the same time the field of biological research is caught up in a data deluge at the and the complexity of a living system justifies the need for this there are many methods that exist to analyze individual data types no method exists to put heterogeneous data types into a practical model and integrate it and this is a spur in the interest in metabolic metabolic changes due to a decreasing number of newly released antimicrobials uh, and anti cancer drugs dr anu will discuss how the paradigm for metabolic system biology can be used as one way to understand the reprogram reprogramming of cellular pathways during the emergent phenomena of drug resistance such methodologies can be foreseen to lead the way towards individualized therapy and personalized medicine and before dr anu starts a quick announcement for all of you so at the end of the talk like always we will have a question and answer session if you have any questions please put them only in the q and and a tab which you can see in the bottom of your player and we'll address them at the end of the talk so over to you dr anu thank you uh so uh thanks a lot at the outset i would like to thank manav the human atlas initiative dr nagraj uh dhara jyotsna gayatri icer nccs and the whole manav team for the invitation to speak and also for arranging all the logistics for this webinar uh, series uh as the title suggests my talk today is on systems biology approaches uh to overcome drug resistance in cells Uh, although the title and the outline may seem esoteric to many who are not familiar in this field throughout this talk i will walk you through some of the fundamental concepts and definitions in systems biology and some of the methods used in my laboratory to understand chemo resistance of brain cancer cells uh in the context of the story i'll give you a background on what the system is all about as well uh so oops my screen is not moving okay yeah so is now as, yes yeah so as i just mentioned my lab uses systems approaches to identify strategies to kill both antibiotic resistant pathogens as well as chemo resistant cells however today's talk is based on our research on glioblastoma or brain cancer uh, i've been told that most of my audience is going to be undergraduates and masters degree students today uh so to make sure that my talk doesn't sound full of jargon i've divided it into three parts part one is completely pedagogical and will introduce you to all concepts and definitions that are used in the talk 
part two is also pedagogical, but it will introduce the system of uh, cancer and some of its hallmarks and how that play into the work that we do. Uh, part three will start off with the story of how we discovered neurospheres as a subpopulation within the brain cancer cells and identify them to be drug tolerant or drug resistant. And we will continue to discuss some of the results uh, of omics profiling data, of data-driven analysis, constraints-based modeling, everything that uh, in today's world we call systems biology. Uh, and this will be a little more technical. Uh, but please feel free to post questions, as Dr. Jyotsna mentioned, in the Q&A box, and I will try to answer most of them at the end of the talk. So as I begin, I would like to draw your attention to a few thoughts of Francis Crick on the central dogma and scientific discovery discussed in this book, uh, What Matt Pursued. Uh, these actually relate to the theme of my talk and to systems biology in general. Uh, and what the author says in one of his uh, paragraphs in his book is, almost all aspects of life are engineered at the molecular level and without understanding molecules, we can only have a very sketchy understanding of life itself. What the author is referring to here, in my opinion, is to the molecular dogma of biology and the importance of all levels of molecular hierarchy in the cell, as depicted here, the DNA to RNA to protein, uh, to catalysis uh, of uh, metabolites. And essentially, uh, what he mentions is that Knowing these individual components is not enough and one needs to understand the crosstalk uh, between them to be able to define cell phenotypes and function. Another quote in his book uh, says that uh, the job of theorists, especially in biology, is to suggest new experiments. And a good theory makes not only good predictions, but surprising predictions that then turn out to be true. So essentially here he points out to an agenda for a theorist. So any of you in the crowd who are planning to become computational biologists or mathematical biologists, uh, it basically suggests a responsibility to suggest experiments to the experimental biologist. And he actually says that biological discovery may actually be driven by a novel hypothesis that emerged through an understa a theoretical understanding of the system. So since this talk is focused on systems biology approaches to understand drug resistance, let us first understand what drug resistance is. So there are many ways of defining drug resistance. The one I like to use uh, is the uncontrolled growth of cells or pathogens, even in the presence of drugs, and especially at concentrations of the drug that are generally therapeutic. Uh, so as a corollary, uh, drug resistance occurs when the drug has lost its ability to kill or retard cell growth. Now, drug resistance can be used in the case of antibiotics and also chemotherapeutic drugs. So it can refer to the inhibition of either a pathogen or a mammalian cell or a tumor cell. Now, uh, there's another term that one can come across in literature, which is drug tolerance, which is essentially a pharmacological concept. And it is used in the context of patients or human subjects that have reduced impact uh, of a certain uh, drug due to repeated use of that therapeutic agent. So now that we have an understanding of what drug resistance is uh, uh, in the context of my talk, let's touch upon another fundamental question, what is life? Now the simplest unit of life is a cell and each cell must exhibit all the characteristics of life. Uh, in a sense, you can consider the cell to be life's atom. Uh, these two ideas lead to our modern understanding of cells as the basic unit of life uh, that underpins all reproduction and development. Uh, there are two known principal dimensions of life or cell function, uh, and these are defined by growth and energy generation. This duality of cell function is primarily orchestrated by metabolic networks. Uh, so metabolic networks are essentially critical for survival, and there is a metabolic cost that is associated with uh, any type of drug resistance which as I mentioned in the previous slide, is uncontrolled growth. So metabolism, as you are all familiar with and probably have studied from high school, uh, is essentially the sum of all the reactions, chemical reactions that are occurring in a cell. 
Uh, and uh, the duality of function of metabolic networks stems from two principal dimensions of anabolic growth, uh, which is essentially catabolism and energy formation. Uh, so an electron donor is typically converted to form biomass, energy, waste and heat, as you all know, and this is generally aided by an electron acceptor. Uh, the electron donor is generally a carbon substrate like glucose or glycerol, and it is taken up into the cell, converted via catabolism to a smaller molecule uh, that then sees the electron transfer chain or what is commonly known as the ETC as shown in this figure. Uh, the electron donors uh, are generally NAD or NADP and they transfer electrons. Uh, the resulting uh, NADH or NAD or NADPH, NADP couples uh, that basically arise out of the oxidation of these electron donors are either used for anabolic or for chemiosmotic uh, machinery to generate biomass or energy. So this is essentially uh, the whole basis of cell function or life. Uh, that is basically growth and growth dictated by metabolic networks. So to obtain a better understanding of life and biological components and how they work together. So the cell function, growth, energy formation, and drug resistance are all linked by redundant pathways uh, and pleiotropy that exists in the cell. The properties of the cell are more than sum of its individual parts. Uh, just like, uh, as you know, uh, parts of a bicycle, uh, only when they come together, uh, they form uh, you know, the motion of movement using the piston action, uh, or component circuits when they come together, uh, they form a radio or when, a, when multiple instruments uh, play together, they form a symphony orchestra. So each of these individual uh, players or instruments in an orchestra or uh, circuits, capacitors in a radio or parts of a bicycle do not make up the bicycle or the radio or the orchestra. It's everything that comes together which is much more and that essentially is called or defined as the emergent property in systems biology and that is the basis of complexity uh, that exists uh, around the world not only in life but also in other man-made objects. So as seen here all the individual components of the cell or the system are interconnected as I've shown here there's the whole central dogma all the way up to the organism level and there's a, the presence of downward and upward causation uh, results in no privileged level of causation and uh, therefore the uh, crosstalk or the interaction between all these different components is essential to ravel, unravel the complexity of cell function uh, and understand uh, complex biological phenomena or emergent uh, biological phenomena like drug resistance. So moving on to cancer, which is generally known as a complex disease, let me introduce to you what is cancer. Uh, cancer essentially begins when a single cell begins to grow out of control and thus uh, results in chronic expansion of previously well-behaved cells in our bodies. Uh, now Hallahan and Weinberg were two very famous scientists, uh, cell biologists and doctors. Uh, and in 2000, uh, the year 2000, they set out to define common principles underlying cancer. Uh, which has been identified over uh, several years or decades of uh, research, almost half a century of research. And they were formalized as hallmarks of cancer, as is depicted in this figure here. And essentially, they uh, describe eight acquired functional capabilities that allow tumors to do something active, to do something that normal cells should not, and typically to do them chronically, rather than during a carefully orchestrated uh, activity of cells and organs in the body. Uh, I'm not going to uh, mention all of them. They are mentioned in this figure here, uh, but some of them include limitless proliferative potential, insensitivity to growth signals, uh, evasion of uh, immune response, apoptosis, uh, and uh, angiogenesis. Although Warburg received the Nobel Prize in 1923 uh, for identifying that cancer cells produce lactate, even in the presence of oxygen. Uh, it has only been quite recently recognized that metabolism is a, an emerging hallmark of cancer. And it's probably because the connection or the links between metabolic alterations 
uh, and how they impinge upon each other and the non-metabolic characteristics of uh, cancer have only recently been uh, delineated. So cancer is thus a disease of extraordinary complexity at all levels, uh, genetic, histological, pathological, prognostic, therapeutic, you know, as is mentioned here in this figure. And what makes it even more complex is the fact that uh, there, is the, there is this process of recurrence, of remission, and of uh, uh, progression. Uh, so uh, cancer is a multi-hit and a multifactorial disease. Uh, and by multifactorial, I mean there are many factors that impact it, in, including the environment, pH, oxygen, chemotherapeutic drugs that are used to treat the disease. And by multi-hit, I mean it changes multiple parameters in the cell, uh, the physiology, uh, molecular changes in DNA, RNA, protein, and metabolite levels. So in order to understand the emergent properties of such a complex disease, uh, one needs a more a syst systemic systems or a holistic approach. Now cancer can affect any cell in the body and in our lab we study uh, the impact of cancer on uh, the brain cells uh, or glioblastoma. Uh, so glioblastoma starts from brain cells and it demonstrates infiltrative growth and what I mean by infiltrative growth is that it's like mixing black and white uh, sand together or salt and pepper together. So it makes differentiation from the normal brain, brain cells extremely difficult. So as you can imagine, if a surgeon has to recess the tumor, it's almost impossible for um, the surgeon to recess the complete tumor uh, without hurting the normal brain uh, cells. It is very aggressive and the mean survival or the median survival time is around 15 months with the current therapy. And some of the hallmarks include uh, metabolic demand, necrosis, and microvascular uh, proliferation. Uh, the current treatment strategies of our glioblastoma, whose prognosis is really poor, include surgery, radiation, uh, chemotherapy using Temodar or Avastin, and I will talk about these drugs uh, soon. Uh, uh, and uh, however, due to the uh, problem of tumor recurrence and having a mean uh, survival time of only around 15 months, uh, there is a need, uh, there's an urgent need for new therapeutic options and experimental therapies to be uh, designed. Uh, so a little about the drug temozolomide. Now temozolomide is a drug that is used, it's the primary uh, drug treatment strategy for glioblastoma. Uh, the clinicians thus call it the first line of therapy for glioblastoma. It is essentially a methylating drug. So for people who do not know what methylating drug means, uh, it provides met methyl groups or methyl groups to go and attach uh, to the DNA. Uh, so it is generally administered as a pro-drug uh, and it converts to an active form called MTIC. Um, I will not read out the complicated name that is mentioned here. Now, MTIC has a very short half-life and it converts to AIC, which is amidoimidazole carbozomide and uh, methyl diazonium ions. Now, some of you are studying chemistry or uh, the interface of biology and chemistry, you must have heard of diazonium salts or methyl diazonium salts uh, when you study dye synthesis, drugs and dye synthesis. So the reason why this is very important, this particular molecule is important, is that it is this ion, the methyl uh, diazonium ion, that provides the methyl groups that are required to methylate DNA. So that is the mechanism of drug action. And the DNA is methylated in the N7 and the N3 positions of guanine that are present in the DNA. And I'm sure you all remember that uh, DNA is made of ATGC. So uh, although this methylation is very um, successful, has been very successful as a strategy for treating glioblastoma, uh, the methylation process can be reversed. And one of the key players in this process is a gene uh, or a protein called NGMT, which is essentially the methylguanine DNA methyltransferase. And so as the name suggests, what it does is it is a repair enzyme and it removes the methyl group from the methylguanine. 
thereby it undoes the damage that is caused by temozolomide. Uh, so this uh, causes recurrence of uh, glioblastoma and this has been shown way back in 2009 in the clinic. Uh, and when temozolomide is used along with radiation therapy, it was seen using the, uh, this uh, clinical cohort. Uh, in this Kaplan-Meier curve, you can see that the mean survival time increases from 15 months to about two to five years. And hence, uh, you know, it's really, it was really sad that uh, resistance to temozolomide developed uh, very quickly. I think it was introduced in about uh, 2005 and within a couple of years, uh, by 2009, uh, they saw that uh, resistance to temozolomide started coming up. So this also uh, suggests the urgent need to develop alternate uh, therapies and therapeutic strategies towards uh, glioblastoma. Uh, so with this tacit background uh, of many concepts, and uh, I hope that I have been able to give you enough background to understand some of the research done in my laboratory, I will now discuss the research that has uh, recently been accepted in a Nature Partner Journal, NPJ Systems Biology and Applications. And uh, I will continue my talk on how technology and computation can help delineate varying components uh, of the glioblastoma cell uh, and the interaction between heterogeneous data types uh, that result in understanding the emergent properties of the cell. And as I mentioned, it is the emergent properties that define a complex system. And that is why uh, systems biology is needed. Uh, the emergent property that we are looking at, as I mentioned earlier, is the susceptibility and resistance of glioblastoma cells to the response uh, and the response to temozolomide. So essentially, I will talk about uh, delineation of um, or enumeration of different components, followed by data-driven analysis that allows us to understand some of the mechanisms. Uh, and some modeling that would allow you to predict mechanisms of uh, uh, that emerge uh, that are not obvious uh, when you delineate uh, uh, all these uh, uh, component types, like you know the exome data, uh, the metabolite profiles, the respirons, the phenomes, etc. Uh, sometimes just delineating and just putting down these components are not necessary, and you need a platform where you can integrate them. Uh, so that you can then compute cell function and understand um, uh, emergent properties. It's essentially systems biology. Uh, so in our study, we have used a very commonly used uh, model cell line that is available in cell culture collections all over the world. It's called U87MG. And U87MG generally grows as an adherent population with an epithelial morphology as seen in the first image. Uh, now in our experimental work, which was initially geared towards measurement or development of techniques to measure metabolites in the cell line, we observed that a small number of cells kept coming up to the top of the flask and kept floating uh, away from this adherent population. Now, anyone who knows uh, uh, a little bit about cell culture, uh, essentially knows that floating cells mean bad news to experimentalists. So essentially floating cells signify uh, dead cells and we don't want to see dead cells in our population. So it indicates, you know, a lot of problems in our uh, culturing techniques. Uh, so uh, what we did was we decided to use a dead or alive test, which is basically staining with the dye called trepan blue which allows one to indicate uh, whether cells are alive or dead. And we had good news there and we found out that all these cells were alive and that made us wonder why they were dying. So here we have stained the cells with um, uh, a dye, a hex dye. And what we observed was that um, these spherical cells that came to the top, which I will refer to as NSP, uh, short for neurospheres throughout the rest of my talk, these cells seem to um, efflux the dye, the hex dye, and therefore stained less. And essentially, uh, this was one way that we uh, could separate the cells using a fluorescence activated cell sorting. So we used this fluorescent dye and sorted the cells. And once these cells were sorted, we decided to look for, uh, uh, you know, whether they had different growth characteristics. 
So when separated, these cells grew as spheres. The cells that were floating on top. Uh, the uh, etherent population continued to grow as an etherent population. And from the initial growth experiments, we identified that uh, neurospheres, uh, so neurosphere, all the data related to the neurospheres will be shown by red uh, dots or red uh, legends, red marker, po red marker points throughout the stock. And we will refer to the neurospheres as NSP. Uh, all the data for the adherent cell line will be shown in blue. And the thing we will refer to uh, U87NG as just U87 in most cases. Uh, so we found, we identified, as seen in this uh, uh, sigmoidal growth plot here, that uh, neurospheres or NSP had a much higher doubling time, so they grew slower uh, than U87. Uh, we also decided to uh, look at whether these cells were uh, how they tolerated the drug. Uh, so in any drug study, one wants to look at the uh, response to different concentrations of the drug, understand what is the IC50 or the minimal dose that is required to kill 50% of the cells. And we identified for the neurospheres that this concentration was 40% uh, higher than what was required for the epithelial population. Uh, we also identified that uh, uh, since the cell floated, uh, we wondered whether these cells were uh, the cause uh, for migration and metastasis in tumors. And so we decided to uh, look at their dif differentiation capability uh, by adding certain growth, factor, growth factors and differentiation factors. And indeed, as seen in this uh, figure on the right side panel, we see that uh, these spherical cells uh, differentiate into adherent neuronal cells with uh, star-like morphology under the right conditions. Uh, so with, so based, oops, yeah. So based on these experiments, we knew that the primary phenotype uh, of U87 and NSP are different in their initial characterization of morphology. Uh, NSP was spherical, U87 was the typical star-like neuronal adherent cell type. Uh, the growth was different, the growth profiles were different. Uh, NSP grew much slower than U87. Uh, the drug dose response was different. Uh, NSP had 40% higher requirement of the drug and in the micromolar range that really um, is a high dose to give to any patient. Uh, and it also had differential uh, differentiation abilities. So now in order to understand this difference in the primary phenotype and genotype relationship, we decided to delineate the genetic basis of this difference by sequencing the exome of both these populations. Uh, and although the alterations in genotype would allow us to understand the origins of these two cells genetically, we also wanted to identify, are there any other altered programs in the other layers of molecular hierarchy that constitute the central dogma that cause them to become you know, further outlaw cells, right? Cancer cells in themselves are outlaws as compared to normal cells. But resistant cancer cells are, you know, they're a higher degree. They are like serial killers amongst the criminals. So we wanted to identify are there altered programs, uh, you know, that make these cells outlaws? And do they have reprogram? have they reprogrammed? And how have they reprogrammed for proliferative expansion, even in the presence of uh, drugs? So we looked at different secondary phenotypes that include respiration, metabolism, nutrient preferences, and chemosensitivity. Uh, so since, as I mentioned to you earlier in the introductory slides, that the chemical, engineer, chemical engine for growth and proliferation is metabolism, uh, we used LC-MS-MS, so liquid chromatography combined with mass spectrometry to monitor the differential uh, nutrient uptake of glucose and other amino acids, which are essential for growth of mammalian cells. And we found that glucose was taken up linearly by U87-NG uh, and it correlated with the release of lactate, which is essentially consistent with the Warburg effect. Uh, and uh, it was much faster than in the case of neurospheres. What is the take-home lesson from this slide is that uh, if you compare the growth-limiting nutrients between U87 and NSP, 
U87 is the susceptible population, suscept drug susceptible population, and USPS are the drug resistant or drug tolerant population. Uh, the growth limiting metabolites that are common between the two are glutamine, glucose, and serine. Uh, and tryptophan, however, comes out as a growth limiting metabolite only for uh, U87 uh, MG. Uh, so that is a very interesting phenotype because we can then probe later how tryptophan uh, can impact other processes that are not in the metabolism hierarchy, uh, but can connect to other um, hallmarks of cancer, uh, including uh, chromatin modification and uh, immune evasion. Uh, so partial least square discriminant analysis is a method that is used in statistics to differentiate uh, data types, uh, heterogeneous data types. And here we've used it to differentiate U87 and NSP as two different clusters. The one, uh, the green cluster is the neurospheres and the blue cluster is uh, U87. Uh, what is in between in the, in red or which is uh, evident as a pink a cluster is essentially the uh, differentiated cells. Uh, what is also observable uh, when you compare uh, the uh, uh, variable importance of projection scores for both U87 and NSP is that you can see overflow metabolism of glucose to lactate, glutamine to glutamate and alanine and serine to glycine. Uh, interestingly, glutamine and serine uh, in the microenvironment maximally discriminate NSP. Uh, or neurospheres, the drug resistant population, and glucose and lactate maximally discriminate U87, which is basically the susceptible population. So this gives us indication that there could be some major differences uh, in the way cells metabolize nutrients and thus would impact or govern a drug resistance. Glycine is also seen to be quite important in the case of the drug susceptible population U87. Uh, so, growth of U87 and NSP in the presence of temozolomide uh, gives you an indication of uh, how uh, varying drug concentrations impact uh, the physiology of the cell. And here we have tested, uh, uh, we, here we have tested three uh, different concentrations. One minimum concentration about 10 micromolar, uh, uh, intermediate concentration of about 100 micromolar of temozolomide and uh, a higher concentration, which is essentially the IC50 value uh, for U87, that is 700 micromolar of uh, temozolomide on the growth and proliferation uh, of um, uh, both U87 and NSP, the brain cancer cells. Now growth, as you can see here, was unaffected in both NSP and U87 at 10 micromolar. Uh, at, uh, U87 has lower growth rates in the presence of 100 micromolar TMZ. Uh, it is almost a 2.5 fold change or a 43% reduction in its uh, growth rate. Uh, it shows a death profile, however, in the presence of 700 micromolar TMZ. NSP, however, seems to continue to survive and shows consistently uh, low growth rates in the presence of both 100 as well as 700 uh, micromolar. Uh, temozolomide. Now this here shows the impact of varying drug concentration uh, in the microenvironment uh, on the metabolism of uh, these glioblastoma cells. So there is a differential uh, consumption and release or core profile of metabolites. Uh, the presence of temozolomide and the concentration dictate the exometabolome or the extracellular profile that is given on the left side here. And uh, however, what we see based on the right-hand side uh, clustergram is that intracellular response is quite cell-specific. Now, this potentially emphasizes how microenvironment is changed through a dynamic change in drug concentration and how that might impact pathways in the cell and redirect uh, reprogramming of metabolism. And this rewiring is quite different based on the cell type. So the rewiring is essentially the intracellular profile and the impact or the dynamic change or the microenvironment changes the extracellular profile.
This is further uh, uh, analysis. This is discriminant analysis, as I showed you in the earlier slide in the absence of the drug. So here you see the discriminant analysis of metabolism in the presence of the drug at varying concentrations. And the interesting thing to note here is that the intracellular and the extracellular profiles seem to be orthogonal or perpendicular to each other. The metabolites that characterize the impact of TMZ on the cell are also different. And this is seen by the heat map on the right that shows a uh, difference in the VIP scores of a lot of the uh, nutrient metabolites. So what is seen here is that uh, uh, glutamine is critical to the growth and survival of NSP uh, in the extracellular microenvironment and lactate and glucose are once again seen to be critical in that of uh, uh, U87. Now glu glucose, glutamate and lactate become critical intracellularly for NSP uh, during survival in the presence of uh, temozolomide. So you see that there's a changing impact of each of the nutrient metabolites based on the presence or absence of the drug and also based on the concentration of the drug. Nalit is also seen to be potentially critical to the survival of NSP, suggesting a functional role as has been seen earlier here on the left-hand side profile, the extracellular profile, you can see that the mallet is very different. So we uh, hypothesize that there should be a functional role for the same. So once we understood the uh, changes in metabolism or the uh, rewiring that occurred in metabolism, we looked at nutrient preferences uh, for respiration and growth. And uh, we profiled uh, this difference using microarray, uh, uh, pheno phenotypic microarrays uh, by a company called Biolog and Biolog, is, Biolog plates essentially are uh, 96 well plates with uh, sole carbon and nitrogen sources uh, and with certain media that allows them to, uh, uh, that allows for minimal salts and uh, buffering. Uh, and what we see here in uh, this uh, subplot of multiple uh, growth profiles, uh, again here, the blue lines represent uh, uh, growth in respiration on uh, of U87, and the red lines represent uh, NSP. So if you have trouble remembering this, NSP is the uh, drug resistant cell, so it is more dangerous to human as compared to U87, which is the drug susceptible cell. So danger is indicated by red, and that's how my student decided to label these in red and blue. So that might help you. The red always stands for NSP, the more dangerous cell, and U87 is represented by blue. So you can see here that there's a combination of the, uh, uh, the rates or the kinetics of utilization of different carbon and nitrogen sources. Uh, and what is seen is that in, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm just pointing out to some of them where there's a stark difference between U87 and NSP. Uh, what was really interesting for us was glucose, which is a common substrate between the two. It's a growth limiting substrate between the two, had different rates of utilization or rates of, uh, uh, you know, respiration in the presence of uh, glucose. And similarly, we see differences in citrate, which is a fatty acid uh, intermediate. Uh, and uh, what is also, uh, what was also noteworthy is that uh, when you probe the number of substrates that NSP can respire and grow on, it is much higher as compared to U87. However, U87 can take up many more metabolites for respiration, but it cannot utilize them for growth. So that was a very interesting observation. Uh, when you look at the uh, clustergram, uh, which is a max normalized cluster clustergram, we see that there is a, a decoupling uh, in U87 between growth and respiration, and there's a coupling uh, in NSP between growth and respiration. So this essentially means that whatever substrates, even if there are fewer substrates that NSP can respire on, it can also grow on them. Whereas U87 need not grow on all the substrates it can respire on. And I'm sure that you remember what is the difference between respiration and growth, right? So that is the um, take home lesson over here that NSP couples growth and respiration, whereas U87 does not. 
Now, based on all these differences in uh, metabolite uptake, in nutrient uptake, growth, respiration, etc., we decided to look at some of the gene expression profiles. So we did a limited gene expression profile. We looked at mRNA abundances using RT-PCR. We looked at a bunch of candidate genes, the 23, 23 candidate genes that are known uh, in literature to be critical to glioblastoma. And we found a bunch of differences as shown in this heat map. And we also looked at ABC transporters, uh, which are also critical to both drug efflux as well as uh, nutrient uptake uh, and uh, transport. And uh, obviously in this um, graph uh, at the bottom in black and white, you see that the expression levels of all the ABC transporters are different uh, between um, NSP and U87. And this probably is what dictates or shapes the metabolite uptake and the release rates. Uh, and hence, that is why uh, metabolism uh, proceeds in a very different fashion uh, in U87 and NSP. So once we looked at all these phenotypes, we really want, we were re really curious to understand what is the genotype underlying uh, uh, these uh, changes in phenotype. Uh, what we saw using whole exome uh, sequencing is that uh, genes are mutated extensively in both U87 and NSP. Uh, and what we see is that uh, the number of distinct mutations in U8, uh, U87 and NSP are lower than the number of common mutations. So one of the reasons we wanted to exome profile these strains is we wanted to see whether we could understand the origin of neurospheres. Do they come from U87 or is there a common progenitor that uh, gives rise to both U87 and NSP? And we thought by doing a common and unique analysis of the mutations uh, that uh, were found in uh, U87 and NSP would give us a clue to that. But unfortunately, we found both common and unique mutations. Uh, there were several number of mutations, as you can see here, there are 29,000 odd mutations in U87 and 30,000 odd mutations in Eurospheres. So they are riddled with mutations. So on curating these mutations, we found that uh, 11,000 were common between the two cell types. 397 mutations were unique to U87 and 559 mutations were unique to Eurospheres. Uh, when we compare the metabolic genes, because we are really interested in understanding metabolism, because metabolism can, um, governs resistance and growth, we saw that there, were, there was a difference of about 7% between the two cell types. And so this gives you an overview uh, that uh, uh, of different genes that are mutated in different chromosomes based on the color here. So they are color coded based on their uniqueness. Uh, Common mutations in U87 are in blue. Uh, common mutations in NSP are in pink. Uh, unique mutations, uh, oops, sorry. The common mutations are in blue. Uh, in U87, the common mutations uh, are in green for NSP and the unique mutations are in pink and red. So although only 7% of the total genes uh, that were mutated belong to the metabolic gene class, there are 44 genes in neurospheres that have unique uh, mutations. And so these would definitely impact the way cells metabolize uh, nutrients and eventually impact growth. And I will come to those, the details of these mutations uh, in a few minutes. So there were 496 common metabolic uh, uh, mutations between uh, or genes that were mutated between U87 and NSP. Uh, the unique genes that were mutated in U87 were 15 and 44 unique genes were mutated uh, that were related to metabolism in NSP. So this figure actually shows you the mutational profile of growth factors, <coughs> excuse me, and signaling related genes that are involved in metabolism. And they also show the uh, genetic makeup uh, of the altered phenotypes in terms of the number of mutations in these genes. So for example, if you see a larger cross, like for example, in RAS, uh, there are more mutations in 
NSP because a red denotes NSP and blue denotes U87. And similarly, if you see the certs at the bottom of the left-hand side uh, uh, pathway, you see that the sirtuins are more mutated in U87 than they are in NSPs. Now, for those of you who are new to mammalian cell metabolism, uh, one major difference between a mammalian cell and a prokaryotic cell like E. coli that you probably are all familiar with and probably have even grown them in the lab using, say, luria broth or glucose media or something like that, is that mammalian cells are not cell autonomous for metabolite uptake and growth. So they need signaling factors to be turned on so that they can uptake nutrients. So if you have two flasks, put in a E. coli cell and a mammalian cell in those two different flasks with glucose, the E. coli cell will start utilizing glucose right away when it knows that it needs to grow. Whereas a mammalian cell cannot start utilizing that glucose, that, although it needs it for growth, unless the signaling factors turn on and they uh, dictate uh, the cell to take up glucose. Uh, so hence, mammalian cells are not cell autonomous for growth. And as you can see here, the receptor tyrosine kinases or the RTKs on the left side, those are the uh, growth factors and they are essential. Uh, uh, you know, they basically dictate a program uh, or so that uh, uh, nutrients or glucose can be taken up. And this program is essentially coordinated by three main genes, the PI3K kinase, AKT pathway, and the mTOR pathway. Uh, PI3K pathway is controlled by P10. What is interesting to note in this figure here is that P10 only has a single red cross. That means the negative controller of uptake of glucose is mutated in NSP because NSP is denoted by red. And what is also interesting is that mTOR complex, which is riddled with mutations, uh, the negative regulator of that TSC1 is mutated only in U87MG. So essentially amino acid uptake and glucose uptake are uh, different, uh, the regulators of metabolism for uh, these two uh, sets of uh, nutrients are differentially mutated across U87 and NSP, the two different cell types. Once again, NSP is the drug resistant cell type and U87 is a drug susceptible uh, cell type. So another thing to note here is that eventually all the metabolism would lead to oxidative phosphorylation and the electron transport chain which is, uh, you know, which as you all saw in the very first picture that depicted life and, uh, you know, how metabolic uh, networks orchestrated growth. Uh, you saw in that picture, oxidative phosphorylation is essentially elect the electron transport chain function. And the uptake of all these uh, nutrients would eventually impact uh, oxidative phosphorylation. So the... Uh, so all the work that has been done experimentally was done by Rupa. Rupa was my previous graduate student. She's one of my first, she was one of my first graduate students. And now she's in Institute uh, for Systems Biology in Seattle uh, as a project uh, scientist. Uh, so what she noted was that in addition to all the uh, mutations we had in uh, the growth signaling, uh, we had a lot of mutations uh, in the electron transport chain. So what is seen here is that uh, once again, uh, the electron transport, transport chain is riddled with mutations, but again, they are differential mutations. Uh, there are very few mutations that are unique. Uh, there is one in SDHA, which is denoted in blue, that is unique to U87. Uh, the mutations in red are unique to NSP. So there's a mutation in Psych1 and COX10, uh, in NSP that are unique. Uh, ATP4A is related to the ATPase reaction and that has a unique mutation only in NSP. And hence there seems to be a differential function in uh, that is uh, probable uh, in this electron transport chain. Now, just to recall for all of you students, the electron transport chain has two different functions. One is the transfer of electrons to the redox transfer of electrons from NADH to molecular oxygen. And the other is the conversion of the free energy of this electron motive force 
uh, through a proton gradient to make ATP, right? So there are two functions. One is electron generation, redox transfer, and the other is ATP synthesis. Now you can see here that ATPA F2, uh, which is an ATP synthase gene, is uh, mutated only in U87. And the ATP is, ATPase gene, the ATP4A, is mutated only in NST. So these two are very critical to the formation of both uh, electron transfer and ATP synthesis, and hence this is what defines growth. And if you recall my uh, figure that showed the subplots of growth and respiration on multiple substrates, I told you that NSP can couple both, whereas U87 cannot couple respiration and growth. And that's probably because ATP synthesis is compromised in U87. So until now, I've shown you that we can delineate uh, a lot of, uh, 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 delineate a lot of data, or a lot of component data using multiple profiling methods, right? Uh, but what this tells you is only uh, details about the, uh, uh, details about that particular component of hierarchy. So if you look at resp respiration, you'll understand about respiration. If you look at the uh, exome profile, you'll understand genome plasticity. If you look at metabolic profiles, you'll understand metabolic um, nutrient uptake, uh, consumption and release profiles, and so on and so forth. Uh, but how do you actually uh, understand uh, the emergence of the property of drug sensitivity or resistance? And this can be done in the context of uh, a genome scale uh, model or a mathematical model. Uh, and as you've seen in the hallmarks of cancer, uh, just targeting one particular aspect, like we were targeting methylation of DNA, is not sufficient. Uh, for a therapy to endure for a long time. So in order to understand uh, what is the impact of all of these uh, on the cell, one needs a mathematical platform. And so in this context, we developed a glioblastoma-specific model, a model that can uh, represent both U87 uh, and NSP uh, separately uh, using the concepts of network reconstruction and constraints-based flux balance analysis. Now, these are huge uh, terms and they are a mouthful, but I will go ahead and explain some of them over here. So how do you reconstruct a network, right? So we start with the component annotation or the open reading frame of a organism or a cell, right? In this case, we have already enumerated it. We have seen differences between U87 and NSP. Uh, so please try to look at it in that context so you can understand the rest of the talk. The function of the products here, like for example, if you look at the green, orange, and red open reading frames can be very varied. The protein might have regulatory function and can bind to the DNA like this green circle here. And then it can either, uh, you know, uh, induce or repress transcription of certain genes. Multiple proteins like the red triangle and the orange square can come together uh, to form a protein complex that can catalyze a reaction like a isomerization reaction. Uh, right, so the interaction between these components uh, of a system can be uh, represented in a variety of forms, but we prefer a mathematical formalism, which is called a matrix. Uh, and once we have this representation, we have annotated the system as, as a whole. And this whole process of annotation is called uh, reconstructing the system. So as you see here, with just three open reading frames or genes, uh, three proteins, uh, and uh, three plus three plus two, so that's eight interactions, we already have a matrix, uh, an eight by three matrix, right? So uh, you can see that once we have a huge biochemical network we, uh, or a huge genome, we can represent all of this mathematically in the form of a matrix. I'll go ahead uh, to tell you that once you, what is the advantage of representing them as a matrix? The advantage is that uh, you will have the tools of linear algebra, uh, linear programming, and convex analysis uh, that will be available for you to then interrogate a uh, cell function. Uh, what are the elements in this matrix are essentially stoichiometric coefficients. 
So as you can see here, the metabolite A goes to B is an isomerization reaction. So uh, if the coefficient of stoichiometry is one, uh, A would get a positive number, so plus one, and B would become, uh, sorry, the opposite. If a substrate is consumed, it gets a negative uh, sign, and if it is produced, it gets a positive sign. I will depict that in the context of uh, the assembly and reconstruction of glycolysis, a pathway that you are prob all of you are probably familiar with since high school. Uh, so as you can see here in the first panel, you have all the reactions of the biochemistry of glycolysis. Uh, on the bottom panel here, uh, you have a matrix. Now each uh, column in this matrix represents one reaction in the biochemistry. So for example, Enolase is represented in the last but one column of this matrix and based on the substrate and the products and based on the stoichiometry of those substrate and the products, you develop a chemical reaction vector, which essentially is the stoichiometric coefficient of consumption and production. So here for enolase, you have two PG or two phosphoglycerate giving H2O plus PEP. Uh, so the column here indicates the last but one column indicates uh, that particular reaction. The rows are the metabolites. So you can see that the last three metabolites are, or last four metabolites are uh, 2PG, PP, H2O and pyruvate. So for the enolase reaction, uh, 2PG is converted to PP and H2O. So P, uh, 2PG gets a minus one um, coefficient. Uh, or element in the matrix uh, reaction vector and PEP and H2O get positive one. So this is a very elegant way to connect the biochemistry to the mathematics. What you see as the outermost interface of the model is uh, this matrix, but what is underneath it is its biochemistry, all the reactions. And furthermore, you can tie up the genetics uh, uh, using Boolean logic. So you can indicate whether it is a single gene protein association like enolase. Uh, this example here is of E. coli. So B2779, the ORF codes for the uh, gene enolase, also called as eno. And eno catalyzes, eno is a protein that catalyzes the reaction to PG going to H2O plus PEP. There are a lot of other complex relationships, like for example, pyruvate kinase, uh, the PYKF and PYKA here are uh, are essentially isozymes. You can also represent protein complexes this way. Uh, so all once, what do you do? Once you have a stoichiometric matrix, you can develop a formalism where you can multiply this matrix by a vector containing fluxes of each of these reactions. And this allows you to define a system of linear equations. And because uh, this is an underdetermined system, uh, you can use optimization and you can uh, identify uh, you know, solutions or solution spaces. Uh, now, what is really interesting about such an analysis is that uh, if you assume that a cell operates under an unbounded space, uh, then uh, you can successively apply constraints, stoichiometric constraints, thermodynamic constraints, enzyme capacity, uh, regulation, concentration kinetics, anything you can uh, obtain by experiment and you result in a solution space that defines what the cell can actually do. And this is neatly captured in Sherlock Holmes quotation. Uh, how often have I told you, uh, when you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable must be the truth. So we've, there are many constraint based methods uh, that have been developed. And uh, what we did in this integrative analysis of glioblastoma cancer cell lines is we applied these methods. I will not go in detail, uh, and if anyone is interested, they can come back and talk to me. I'm available on email as well and on phone. Uh, and we had these certain metabolic uh, perturbations or reprogramming that we were able to predict between the two cell types. Uh, what we also saw was they, when we looked, when we used the constraints-based method of Monte Carlo sampling of the distribution of fluxes, we identified that there was a rewiring in glycolysis in the malate aspartate shunt in folate metabolism, oxidative phosphorylation, cholesterol synthesis, and pyrimidine biosynthesis. So this is shown here by these histograms here. And you can see what I only want you to note is the shifted red and the uh, blue uh, histograms. So that essentially indicates that 
the flux distribution is different for both U87 and NSP. Uh, and based on this, we identified uh, that there would be a change in oxidative phosphorylation and cholesterol metabolism. So we went on uh, to look at how um, we could use a chemosensitivity screen. And we identified, as seen in this bottom panel here, 14 drugs that differentially impacted U87 and NSP, and three of them that can kill NSP alone. Uh, these drugs were from oxidative phosphorylation, rotinone and deguilin, and the other one, the third drug, was from cholesterol metabolism, berberin. Uh, so this, since this was a screen, it was a high-throughput assay. So we went on to look at, with the help of my newer graduate student, Ritu, uh, how uh, cells respond to rotinone, which is essentially a complex one inhibitor. Complex one occurs in the electron transport chain I showed earlier. And as you can see in these numbers here, uh, the IC50 for U87 uh, is 1.8 micromolar, whereas the IC50 for NSP is 5 nanomolar approximately. So this shows a several magnitude, orders of magnitude difference in the amount of drug required to kill NSP, which was uh, resistant to the primary drug uh, that was used to treat glioblastoma. So the next question is, uh, how, does, uh, how can we reduce the amount of temozolomide uh, which is the primary drug of treatment uh, for NSP. So earlier, if you know, if you remember, uh, oops, uh, yeah. So NSP required 1039 micromolar, which is really high to treat uh, 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 to treat NSP to kill NSP uh, to 50 percent of its original cell count. Uh, now, in the presence of uh, rotinone, we only required 1.8 micromolar. So that is also a several order of magnitude uh, reduction. So taken together, our approach of using constraints-based modeling and analysis identified a critical role and vulnerability of complex one uh, of the ETC in the survival of only NSP and not U87. And so it helps identify rotinone as an alternate drug to kill or induce death using TMZ or temozolomide. So in summary, oops. So in summary, what we have done is we have looked at the interplay between metabolism and methylation uh, of the glioblastoma genome to shape, uh, to understand how it shapes temozolomide uh, response. We have looked at metabolic reprogramming. We've identified its response, uh, sorry, it's the reprogramming in response to a DNA methylating agent. I can see Jyotsna's, uh, Jyotsna has come up to say that I, my time's almost up, so. Uh, no, I was so engrossed, actually, I know in the entire presentation, I completely lost track of time, you know, and now I have so many questions to ask, but yeah, please go ahead, like really amazing talk, amazing talk. Thank you, please thank you. Yeah, so we also delineated the genetic base. profiles were investigated and we saw that uh, they could potentially influence both methylation and epigenetic regulation and so future experiments will be towards understanding this epigenetic regulation. Uh, the integrative analysis of all this data in the context of this constraint space human network model of metabolism identified a programmable switch using Monte Carlo simulations uh, and such altered metabolic flux distribution in NSP makes it differentially vulnerable to drugs that target oxidative phosphorylation, glutamine metabolism, cholesterol metabolism, malic aspartic shunt, and so on and so forth. And we finally, as a proof of principle, uh, used rotinone and showed that it had, uh, it, we needed lesser amounts of rotinone through the IC50 values to kill NSP. Uh, and that the dose of temozolomide was reduced by three orders of magnitude in the presence of rotinone. So what are the conclusions and future directions of such kind of analysis and work? Uh, so such analysis can essentially, uh, these are basically integrated system level approaches and they're critical to unravel tracid connections between very disparate uh, phenomena, uh, disparate molecular hierarchies like epigenetics, metabolism, genotyping, uh, genome sequences, et cetera. And they are always scalable to the clinic. Rigorous characterization is essential. This was all done in a model system. So rigorous characterization is necessary in animal models uh, and clinically derived cell lines so to extend the promise of this study. 
And we see that the capability of these approaches can expedite choices for personalized medicine. Uh, so coming to, you know, why I called, or why the first part of my title was, and then there were none. Uh, so Agatha Christie was one of the novels I grew up on. She was one of the most famous mystery novel writers. And I really loved this book written by her. Uh, so there are many analogies between uh, cancer, uh, the disease of cancer, uh, and the book. So to start off, this mystery uh, does not have any detectives. For those of you who have read it, uh, you know, this is probably not new knowledge, but for those of you who have not, I'm sorry to give this spoiler alert. So there, are, there is no detective here. There's no outsider investigating the strange going on in this house that is isolated on top of an island. There's no one trying to find a killer. Uh, there's lots of innocent suspects in this novel. Everyone is a killer. Everyone is a suspect. Everyone is innocent. And so that is what is very central to this mystery. Uh, and that is the same as what happens in uh, cancer, because, you know, it is our own body, our own cells that orchestrate, uh, you know, the evolution or the origin of tumor suppresses or tumor causing uh, or growth suppresses. Uh, they induce tumors in the cell and it is our own cells that then reprogram their pathways to be able to either uh, evade drugs or uh, get susceptible to them. So this book is very much like, uh, you know, what happens in cancer, according to me. That's absolutely my opinion. There's a disclaimer to it. And it also resonates with the uh, book written by Dennis Noble, who is a professor at Oxford. He's a clinician as well as a systems biologist uh, called The Music of Life, uh, Biology Beyond the Genome, where he says that DNA is not a privileged level of causation. And also he says that there's no conductor, real conductor of life. So there's no really, there's not really any uh, uh, privileged level of causation. So it's only interaction, downward and upward causation. Uh, so, you know, I don't think this talk, I would do justice to this talk without the help of all my students. Uh, Rupa who was one of the main players who did all the experimental work uh, related to uh, this talk. Avinash did all the mathematical modeling related to this talk. Uh, this is my new group. My group has evolved from an old group to a new batch of students. Uh, Ritu, who's at the center, uh, wearing the pink vest, was the one who did all the Rotinon experiments. Uh, and I have to acknowledge my funding, uh, DST, DBT, CSIR, the Bill Gates and Melinda Gates Foundation for all their uh, financial support. And uh, you know, I'll leave you with a picture of, oops, I was going to leave you with a picture of other things my group does. And if you'd like to contact me, please uh, contact me at anu.rugnathan at ncl.rest.in. And you can look at our Mice Lab website. We call ourselves the Mice Lab, not because we work on mice, but because we look at metabolic inquiry and cellular engineering. Thank you for your attention. I know I've gone about time, uh, but I'll be happy to take any questions online or offline. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anu. It was astounding, actually. I mean, like like I said, I completely lost track of, uh, track of time and I was so engrossed in what you were saying. Personalized medicine is very dear to me. It's, it's a topic I have been working for some time now. So I was just trying to find, wow, this has so many applications, you know, the metabolic engineering uh, aspect and how it can be you know, how you can manipulate cells and how we can increase the repetitive effectiveness of some of the drugs, you know, deal with chemo resistance. I and mean, there are so many aspects to it. Like, it's it's amazing. But unfortunately, we are really, really short of time. I would, and people have asked questions. I, I think I can take a couple of them. Let's see. Yeah. So there is a question uh, from... Okay, so it's like, it's the, is there a standard method to analyze all the metabolites of a cell? Like if we use hepatocyte homogenate of a normal and cancer cell, can we identify the different metabolites holistically with a TLC or equivalent technique? So probably they're asking about the techniques that you have used, you know, to do the analysis. So would you want to throw some light? Uh, yeah. So there are standard methods to analyze all metabolites of the cell. 
uh, it's easier. Uh, I mean, uh, I would like to qualify that statement uh, by all metabolites might be difficult. All metabolites transcends from metabolic profiles to metabolomics. Uh, so that might be a tall order, but definitely you can look at a lot of metabolites. Uh, you can use standard methods for extraction of these metabolites uh, from a mammalian cell. You can look at, uh, you will, if you want to quantitate them, you need an external standard. So you really need to buy all these standards and create calibration curves. Uh, if you want, um, uh, if you just want differential levels or qualitative differences, you can use an internal standard and you can get uh, those uh, differences easily. That's much more easier than quantitation. In this study, we've mainly looked at quantitation of about 40 or 50 metabolites. Uh, and that was much more a tall order. Uh, nowadays, there are kits that are available uh, that can aid you to do quick metabolite analysis. Uh, and you can go to the order of, uh, I think, about 500 to 1,000 uh, very quickly. Uh, so this can be applicable to any cell. It doesn't matter whether it's glioblastoma, it's a hepatocyte, it's a normal cell. Uh, you can't really use TLC uh, because TLC is a, uh, a TLC, as you know, you use these, um, it's thin layer chromatography. So you would need very large plates uh, to actually lay out, uh, you know, the uh, stationary phase. <coughs> So you won't be able to use TLC, but you can definitely use LCMS. You can use NMR. Uh, these are the standard techniques. Uh, HPLC coupled to MSMS and uh, NMR. Uh, both of these are, have been routinely used to look at metabolites of a cell and to look at high throughput estimations and whole cell estimations as well. That's that's really great. Uh, thank you for that answer. And the, I see there are so many other questions, but like I said, we are short of time. I had few questions and I would like to take the privilege of asking one. Sure. That uh, uh, in your study, uh, we saw so many biomarkers coming up. I was just wondering that do you see uh, some of them used as a uh, you know, surrogate or a biomarker for that matter, you know, uh, to to understand the difference between chemosensitive and chemoresistant cells, resistant cells. So do you, do you foresee some of that, you know, the clinical application side of it? Absolutely. And that's a great question because that is, that sort of pipelines into some of the future work that we are doing. Uh, so as I mentioned in the earlier um, slides, tryptophan is one of the growth limiting metabolites that is seen only in the susceptible cell line and not in the resistant uh, cell line. Uh, and tryptophan is one of the key metabolites that sort of uh, uh, is a control node to get into IDO metabolism and immune suppression and immune response. So we really foresee that, you know, a lot of the metabolic biomarkers that we have uh, delineated in this study can go on to connect to the other hallmarks of cancer belonging to the other hierarchies of the cell, and that can right. eventually be translated clinically. That's the... Yeah, so similarly, the exome data, right? So we have a lot of indications in the exome data of unique mutations in either of these cell types that can also be taken further as genetic markers uh, that can also sort of translate into the clinic. Uh, we also have gene expression profiles. Uh, we can uh, try and identify signatures that uh, define a resistant cell phenotype versus a sensitive cell phenotype. That's right. So, so all these can eventually translate into the clinic, but I think some of the steps that go in between uh, are actually the use of either clinically derived cell lines or uh, animal models. So that would be the stepping stone to moving to that level. Yeah, so PDX is probably the way to go. Yes. Uh, right. Uh, wow, like like I said, an amazing talk, and it was really, really amazing to hear and learn what you are, you and your lab does. So thank you so much, and I'm I would like to thank you on behalf of all the attendees because you know, uh, I would like to take privilege in saying that you have been one of the first uh, who has really touched upon all those basics, got your audience acquainted with everything that you're going to say next. So really, thanks a lot. Thank you very much. And to all the students whose questions I didn't answer in interest of time, please feel free to email me 
and I can answer all your questions. Students and researchers, anyone else in the audience who would like to contact me about this work, uh, please uh, feel free to write to me. Yeah, so I know we'll be sending this list to you probably and you can answer them and we'll send it back to the, you know, the ones who asked these questions. So sure. that's also something. That would be great. Thank you so much. Uh, I would like to make an announcement about our next talk now. So on 3rd of December, we have our next talk from Dr. Kavishwar Vagholikar on machine learning in healthcare. So we'll see you then. And uh, lastly, uh, regarding the feedback form, so you'll be receiving a link of, on which you are, you know, the audience is supposed to fill the feedback and you will be receiving your participation certificates then. And that's all from our side. Once again, thank you, Dr. Anu. Uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jyotsna.